This is a great session. Please welcome from Stella Therapeutics, Professor Nephi Stella. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's a great honor to be here, and uh, especially coming to the place where Rafael Mushulam started the field. He's a true, he's the father of the field, not only scientifically, but as a person. He's such a loving person. Um, so I will be actually talking about the therapeutic promises of cannabis in epilepsy and cancer, and I will touch upon the toxicity. So I have a disclosure, I'm both professor at the University of Washington, as well as the founder and shareholder of Stella Therapeutics. And my areas of interest are the effect of cannabinoids on neurons, as well as the effect of cannabinoids on cancer cells. So our agenda, I have 32 slides. I'm hoping to do that in 25 to 30 minutes. You'll be able to follow. We're at slide number three out of 32. And um, I'll become, start with some background, and I'll give you the legal framework that we have in the state of Washington in the US. I will also touch upon the fact that we're implementing a center for cannabis research at the University of Washington. And I'll want to really talk about the concept of therapeutic index, how cannabinoids can have a medicinal properties and as well as a toxicity profile. I'll touch upon the public health impact, I think the concern around the use of cannabis during pregnancy and during young adults, especially young adults, I'll have a slide on that. And then I'll go over two examples um, of research that we have at the University of Washington in the realms of epilepsy and brain cancer with Stella Therapeutics. And at the bottom of the slide, usually I try to put a punchline so that you can have the main message. So cannabis has been legalized in the state of Washington through the initiative of I-502. It was to remove state law criminal and civil penalties. This is uh, managed by the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board. And what they, uh, we have both recreational, although I'll start uh, using the term adult use, I think that's actually a good term to, uh, to use, and medical use. This is a three-tier system where we have both, we have producers, processors, and retail. And we act, in the state of Washington, the legal framework is really to uh, grow what will be used. There's about 1,300 licenses uh, currently in the state of Washington. And the current sale price, actually, because of the system, has reached what was the illicit market. So we've reached, actually, an um, uh, equilibrium in the price. The estimated sale of cannabis in the state of Washington was 350 million, and actually, we reached 900 million in sales tax. And the projection is that it's going to be a $1.5 billion market just for the state of Washington every year. So there's a huge amount of economy. What's interesting is that about 0.6% of the tax should be redirected towards research in the state of Washington. And that's what the University of Washington is trying to leverage. But I think the next steps now that it's been legalized is really to assure the health and safety of well-being of the individuals. And I think particularly we need to optimize the, medic, the medical cannabis products and, and, and its retail. So if we think about the legalization of cannabis in, in, uh, in the state of Washington, there's both short-term and long-term effects we have to, to, to study. So if you have the cannabis products, there are some potential benefits, which actually can also align with the Washington-oriented cannabis legalization. So the potential pro uh, benefits would be the medicinal properties, for example, for the state of Washington, the, creating, the creation of, of, of employments. There's a harm reduction. The, I think the, the reduction in use of alcohol and opioids has already been in effect in the state of Washington. And there's potential harms also that we need to um, to address, and those are the big questions that uh, are currently tackled at the University of Washington. 
So based on this, uh, as a leadership in the field of cannabis research, I started regrouping the different entities that were interested in, in cannabis-related question. And what we realized is that there's really every entity uh, at the University of Washington that's uh, interested in this, uh, starting from the medicine, nursing, forestry. I think what is really important for the Center of Cannabis Research is that we have also the law school that's very interested, and therefore the law school will be in the middle of the Center for Cannabis, so that providing a strong legal framework for us to, to work within the system. So in summary for the Center for Cannabis Research, our mission is to foster and enable organizing influences around cannabis research. We are hoping to become some of the world experts. And the idea is to promote knowledge on the consequences. We want to foster innovation, research and development at every uh, stage. And our hope is really to become a model of cannabis innovation in the world. So this is going to be a scientific talk. So we're going to start with a hypothesis. The hypothesis is pretty simple. Cannabis has therapeutic value. So we're going to address this hypothesis. And we're going to go both uh, from basic science all the way to humans. So the long-term goal is to understand the details, the molecular mechanism by which cannabinoids uh, act, and that to secure the benefit of public health. The background, we are lucky to have quite a rich body of work around scientific uh, research around cannabinoids. And they produce actually a really wide combination of biological effects as we were uh, talking about this morning. There's effect on sleep, on anxiety, on pain. And we, they are still really not uh, well understood. So that's the idea is we need to further this understanding. The scientific approach, I'm a pharmacologist. My goal is that today everybody will become an expert in cannabinoid pharmacology. So I'll give you the background. And the, is to, the pharmacology is one way to think about it is the science of understanding and optimizing these compounds for, um, for the medical use. The immediate goal, I think, and we have the possibility to develop the first cannabinoid-based transformative therapeutic approach. I think the word transformative is very important. It means that there's, there are diseases where we have nothing to provide to the patients. And if you provide a new medical um, tool that will become a transformative medical approach. It's a very exciting time, I think, in the field of medicine where we're adding a new branch of medicine. So as I said, the scientific approach, one can think about it as in a drug discovery, and we've done that over the years many times. We've done it with aspirins, where we start with a plant product, and eventually it's in a pill. And we can go and have a molecular understanding of how this molecule works. So for aspirin, we actually understand that they inhibit cyclooxygenases. We have the atomic understanding of how this drug interacts. We did the same with opioids over the years. And I think we're geared up in the cannabinoid field to also starting from a plant, being able to provide a product and have a molecular understanding of how these molecules are working. So we want to optimize the therapeutic benefits. I think we're just seeing the tip of the icebergs of the potential of these molecules. So pharmacology and drug discovery, one th can think about it in five steps. The first step is we need to find the active compound, the active ingredient. So we already talked about THC, cannabidiol. Those are the active ingredients. So we want to extract it. That would be one way. We need to understand the pharmacokinetics. How does the molecule travel in our body? That would be number two. And then the pharmacodynamics is when we go at the molecular level, we want to understand how the molecule interacts with the cannabinoid receptors. Think about the key lock concept. THC or cannabidiols are the key, and the receptors are the locks. So we need to find the right key that will unlock the biological response. And then that's the molecular level. We need to understand how the cell 
reacts to this, uh, to this compound. In the, in the case of seizures, Neurons, they need to be uh, tempered, reduce the, ex the excitability in, in terms of cancer cells. Those molecules will kill the cancer cells, so we need to have an understanding at the cellular level. And uh, all of this, if you want to create a new therapeutic, all of these components need to be combined. You need to understand how it travels, you need to understand the molecular level, and that will guide how you can establish the dosing, the concentration, how much for eventually producing a biological effect. So here's the background on the, the one slide background on cannabinoids. We have the bioactive ingredient, delta 9 THC, that will act on cannabinoid receptors, those proteins in our body that are the lock. And these receptors do many things. They will regulate neurotransmitter release in, by neurons, but they also regulate cell migration, cell proliferation, differentiation, and cell viability. Cell viability in the context of cancer, because these compounds actually are killing the cancer cells. In B, you can actually see where the cannabinoid receptors are expressed. They are expressed in the brain, and actually all over the body, there's also cannabinoid CB2 receptors on immune cells, and there's also tissues that express both types of receptors. So overall, we actually have a really large pharmacology. We already have really good tools to perform the basic science and understand how these molecules are working. So the path that I will be following and I'll be outlining is the path of drug discovery. So the idea is that you do that in several steps. From the small molecules, it's a well-delineated path. So an A is what we call the in vitro stage, where we have our molecules that, and our, we're studying how they interact with the cannabinoid receptors, how the cells respond. In B, we move into in vivo. This is when we start testing those molecules in preclinical mouse models. So the idea would be that the molecule would be given to the mouse and we'll see if it acts on the neurons or kill the brain tumor, for example, and eventually all the way to the molecular level. And then we move this into the preclinical stage. And this is where the concept of therapeutic index comes in. We look at how much molecule can we give to have efficacy while reducing the amount of toxicity. That's the therapeutic index. Current chemotherapeutic molecules for cancer have a very narrow therapeutic index. You give the molecule and you have very big uh, side effects. And then eventually, uh, we, you start manufacturing and you go into clinical trials into human phase one, phase two, and phase three. I think about killer ther therapeutic index as the art of healing without harming. So let's start with the impacts on humans. The first example that I'll go over are collaborations between my lab and several researchers. I think one of the most, the biggest concern that we have right now is the use of cannabis during pregnancy. And Pregnant women are well-educated in the fact that they have to stop drinking alcohol and they have to stop smoking cigarettes, but because they think cannabis is organic, it's safe, and that's actually a misconception. So there's both research, but I think there's actually a mainly educational component. We need to educate the population. The biggest concern is that can cannabinoids have an anti-nausea properties. So pregnant women are, are, are seeking uh, cannabis for the anti-nausea, and then there might be toxicity for the uh, embryo. And these actually uh, affect brain development. There's also cannabis in young adults or, or teenagers, the most widely illegal used drug in, in the world, and these have dramatic effect on cognitive function because these cannabinoid receptors are actually involved in shaping and maturing the, the brain. So here's one example of collaboration that we're doing with uh, Dr. Clark, where we're studying the effect of cannabinoids in young rodents, in young rats, and we're actually looking also at the interaction with alcohol. 
And this is a preclinical model. So here's the rat, and what, the way we actually deliver the alcohol and the cannabinoids is in, the, in some gel. So we give them jello shots, basically, with some alcohol or a little bit of THC, and we look at the interaction. And these rodents really enjoy eating these gels, and uh, so we have a good model of edibles that impact the developing brain. And then what we do eventually, we look at the the, the brain physiology and, and how this in, impacts the, the brain functions, but we also look at how it impacts the cognitive functions of, of, of rodents. And for example, those rodents are, 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 are tested in a, in a system where they have to press levels and, and have some rewards, and they are impaired in doing that if they've used alcohol during their young uh, adult stage, and how this interacts with cannabinoids is what we're studying. So I'm going to go over two examples that are the main focus of research that we're doing. First is for the treatment of epilepsy. So we know that epilepsy is a devastating um, disease, affects millions of people. What is actually hard uh, uh, soaring is the fact that about 1% of the populations are young kids that have multiple seizures during the day. And standard care treatments right now for epilepsy are really not doing a really good job. And uh, they have also debilitating effect. And yet, even though they have minimal effect on seizures, this is a multi-billion dollar, um, uh, million dollar uh, are spent worldwide every year. So there's no cure currently available for some of the types of epilepsies. So there's been evidence that cannabinoids affect seizures already starting from the 70s against Canada at the forefront. Here's a study from, uh, from British Columbia where a rat is undergoing some seizures. You can see all these seizure activity very uh, sharp. And when you add THC, those, the seizure activity is reduced. Same thing with cannabidiol. Uh, that's a, a more recent uh, study by, done by um, Ben uh, Wiley, and where you, we see the, the number of seizures that is reduced as you, uh, as you provide them with cannabidiol. So there's high promises of those cannabinoid compounds for treating seizures. And actually, one of the wonderful stories, I think, in our field it came from, uh, from um, um, Colorado, where the, uh, it's been shown that, that cannabidiol has effect on a specific type of seizures uh, in, ch in children called Dravet syndrome. This is the example of Charlotte Figge in uh, Colorado that was receiving cannabidiol and had really uh, a wonderful response to this, to this therapeutic approach. And this, this is the power of mothers, right? When you have a mother that sees that something is helping their children, it, it tells it to other mothers that have all their children, and it just took off, and it started what we call the Charlotte's Web, and it, it really brought our attention to the fact that cannabidiol can really have remarkable effect on, uh, on seizures. And they started with an open-label interventional trial. So. This is a slide that I take from GW, really the pioneer in this, uh, in this field. They're really writing a new page of medicine. It's really remarkable. And now, as you see recently, they have many clinical trials that are ongoing, a phase three actually for uh, Dravet syndrome. I, hope, I heard that uh, we're, there's, there's hope that there's gonna be an FDA approval within a year. So this will be one of the first cannabinoid-based medicine that has been approved and other indication. So we started a collaboration with uh, Dr. Bill Catterall, who's an expert in Dravet syndrome. And we did what I called, I think, backward science. We know that it works in humans, and we verified that it works in mice. And it does. <laughs> and uh, so we actually have a genetic mouse model of Dravet syndrome because Dravet syndrome is a genetic disease, so we can have a mouse model. And these mice undergo febrile seizures. They have, as you raise the temperature, they have an increase in the number of seizures. 
And what we found is that it, cannabidiol definitely blocks seizures and it also reduces SUDEP, which is sudden unexpected death of these children. So remarkable therapeutic efficacy. And it even reduces behavior in, impairment. I have a couple of slides that will go over that. So I think the idea that cannabidiol has an effect is remarkable, but I wonder if we can actually optimize that. And this molecule is just the beginning of a new class of anti-seizure molecules. So we need to understand the molecular mechanism by which cannabidiol does that so that we can optimize it. So here are some of the scientific data. Here what you're looking at is seizure duration in these mice, and as you add cannabidiol, pretty high level, 100, 200 milligrams, you can reduce the seizure duration, you can reduce the seizure se severity, and here's the survival, how you can actually save these mice. Here are the mice that are actually dying, and you can actually save some of these mice. And we even know, we understand the electrophysiology. There's a part of the brain that's involved in seizures, which is called the hippocampus. And what cannabidiol does is it reestablishes the, uh, the network, the electrical network. So very remarkable. I think it's fascinating. This is my favorite. This is actually a... Um, what we call an autistic-like behavior in mice. It, this is a three system. So you put your mouse in a little chamber and it has a mouse that it knows and a foreign mouse, and they spend a lot of time exploring. And we can actually re-establish this autistic behavior that these mice, in acute, one single dose after they had all these seizures during all their life, and then they have the autistic-like behavior, and you provide one dose of cannabidiol, and you can rectify this autistic-like behavior. Remarkable. Okay, the next topic is brain cancer. So there's different types of, of brain cancers. There's the primary brain cancers, which we call glioblastoma multiforme. One is one of the most devastating and common. And there's also secondary uh, cancer, the, the ones that come from the periphery, the metastases. For example, lung, breast, and melanoma. And here you have the numbers. They're devastating. They're death sentences for these patients prognosis usually less than two years. And again, standard care really doesn't have much to offer. And again, it's a multi-billion dollar um, market. The evidence that cannabinoids kill cancer cells comes actually already from the 70s, where the National Cancer uh, Institute was just screening all these molecules to try to find new cancer, uh, anti-cancer drugs. And they found the initial signal that I said, the initial proof that cannabinoids can, can have some anti-neoplastic activity in lung cancer, but it was not very strong, just a slight inhibition of proliferation. And truly, you don't want to just stop the cancer, you want to kill it, you want to eliminate it. And this is a paper that really jump-started the research in my lab is uh, from Manuel Guzman in Spain, showing that cannabinoids can actually kill cancer cells um, in a rat model. And this is a, what we call a Koppelmeier curve, where you have all the rats that are dying because of the tumor. And if you give them THC, you reduce, you extend their lifetime, and you actually save some of the rats. And what I thought was interesting is that synthetic cannabinoids were actually even more potent. And here's an example here where the tumor was here before, and it's completely gone after the treatment of cannabinoids. But when, I, when we started studying this as a pharmacologist, I realized that the pharmacology did not really make sense with what we understood. So what, that was the beginning of our journey, and the idea here is thinking about the pharmacophore. So this is the rings, the chemical structure of the cannabinoids could be depicted as this. And what they do is they act on neurons. That's the psychotropic effect. They could act on immune cells. That's the anti-inflammatory. And they're modest. And they're pretty weak at killing cancer cells. So what we did is two things. What we did is we tried to optimize the molecule and understand the mechanism of action. So ST compounds are synthetic small molecules. We're in the drug discovery space. 
We've reached nanomolar potency, that's very low amount of molecules are required to kill the cancer cells. And we kept the ability of the molecules to pass the blood-brain barrier, which is one of the big challenges of the current therapeutics. And we still keep the safety profile, and we are studying the novel mechanism of action. And currently, our most promising cancer indication, our brain cancer, the uh, GBM, the metastases, melanomas, and currently, we're also exploring colorectal. Three very devastating types of cancers. So what we first, we needed to make sure that this was a novel mechanism of action that is not dependent on what we know of the cannabinoid receptors, the CB1 and CB2. So here you have some cells that do not express CB1 and CB2. This is the compound that we synthesized, first generation uh, compound, ST11, and we did it so that it does not activate the known receptors, CB1 and CB2. And what we found is that this compound inhibits the cell proliferation, but also kills the cells. And you already heard this morning the concept of apoptosis, which is the cell undergoing suicide. And here we show that this compound triggers apoptosis within six hours. It actually um, um, dishevels the, um, the, the, the nucleus, and eventually the cells start exploding and dying. We have the same result in, in, uh, in the mouse model. We show, this is the pharmacokinetics. We follow where the molecule can go. And here you can see that the molecule can reach into the brain. And here is a mouse model where we put, injected a tumor and we add the molecule increasing amount. Here's the total size of the tumor. And as you increase the amount of ST11, you shrink the size of the tumor. And if you look at the tumor in detail and you look at the section, you can see that even in the mouse model of tumors, we can trigger apoptosis. Here's the tumor. The blue, the blue is the nuclei, very dense tumor. And here you're starting at five milligram. You can start here is caspase three. This is apoptosis. These cancers are starting to, start to die by, by suicide even more and even more at 40. Actually, the, you can already see pockets of cells that have died. So the tumor is, is liquefied, it's, it's, it's dissolving. So based on this, we were very excited and start, thought that we would bring this to the next step in clinical trials. So from concept to proof of concept, we started Stella Therapeutics. Eric Horn, my postdoc, my postdoc in my lab, was the first employee, founded in, in 2011. And we were funded by NIH, by Washington sta uh, State uh, Funds, by cancer foundations. And now we have our lead compound, ST11. We've optimized it by 300 times. And we are lucky to have really world-class business and scientific team. So here's, here's, the, here's a cancer cell that is resistant to, can to, to uh, Timodar, standard care. The cancer does not even respond to the standard care. Here's our ST11 that kills, and we're improving it, and we've improved it by 300 times. Now we have nanomolar molecules that can kill these cancer cells. We've understand the mechanism of action. Actually, it, it, what's interesting to me is that we discovered that it acts on microtubules. This is this protein that's involved in cell proliferation. And we've, we've uh, in collaboration with Linda Mortiman, we showed that in A, this works in, in, in biochemical assays uh, or even uh, fluorescent uh, assays where these molecules are destabilizing these microtubules. And we can even do live imaging on how these microtubules are destabilized. And for ST11, you can see that we can, this is another one of those results where you implant the tumor and here are the mice that are reaching end stage. And we can, at least the first uh, set of experiments, we can already double their survival on, on treatment with a certain amount of period. And again, this molecule goes into the brain. So a lot of encouragement for brain metastases. So this is what we're trying to accomplish. We started with a concept, which is there are some molecules in this plant that are really interesting in their ability to kill cancer cells. 
We studied the chemistry, the molecular pharmacology of these compounds, the cannabinoid pharmacophore, and we discovered a unique set of molecules that have been patented that we call ST compounds that kill cancer cells. And we're doing preclinical, and our hope is to bring it to patients in several years and eventually get into FDA approval. So that's it. I just want to thank some of my, these are the people that uh, are working uh, with me. And here I have a special thanks to Oscar Valesco Schmidt, who is here in the audience. Right over here. Look right at this, Oscar, Oscar right there. Yes, he's a, he's a thought. He's a thought leader, really a, uh, an entrepreneur in Seattle, and has been really in, involved in policy making. So we're working together a lot in implementing the Center for Cannabis Research and try to make this cannabis legalization in Washington a success story. Thank you. I have already a first question. All right.